I'm thrilled to see everyone here. I know this is a great program and I want to get right into it, but we do have a couple of business um, things to take care of uh, tonight. Um, the first thing will be, um, I have to introduce um, Tim Flesh, who is the chairman of the nominating committee, because tonight we have to put forth our slate of officers um, for, nomination where uh, tonight we give you the names and uh, next month we vote, the general uh, membership votes um, next month at the May program. So tonight, um, Tim is going to announce a slate of officers uh, proposed and you can also have nominations from the floor and we're looking for a secretary for next year. So if anybody would love to be our secretary, please come to me afterwards or Tim and um, let me know. So meanwhile, Tim will present the slate of officers. Okay, and as Ellen said, the slate, this is the proposed slate. However, we will, you know, we will take more uh, nominees if you, if anybody wants to propose somebody or volunteer themselves. So as the spokesman for the nominating committee, I am very pleased to announce the slate of officers, which will, um, they'll take office in September and go through um, June of next year. So from this September to June of 24. Okay, so uh, President Ellen Flesh, Vice President Ron Hale, Treasurer Jewel Rayburn, Secretary, perhaps one of you, <laughs> uh, members at large, Deb Murator, Cricket Quinn, and Tim Judd. So, um, if any of you want to make a nomination of yourself or someone else, you can, well, see me or Ron or Tim over here at the table and give us your name and we will include you in the list of people who will be voted upon next month, May 4th, please. Yeah, okay. May 4th. Okay, any questions? What a great audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing I would like to um, uh, announce is that at the end of the year banquet this year, um, we, we decided to have a picnic at Camp Eastman. Uh, number one, it will keep costs down. Uh, two, it'll give us a chance to get to know each other better and mingle rather than being at a, a stuffy restaurant somewhere. Um, so I have a sign up sheet there. It would be $15 a person, which would include the rental of the cabin and um, hot dogs, hamburgers, rolls, condiments, water. Um, and then if everybody would bring a dish to pass, um, and uh, BYOB, uh, that would be great. So the sign up sheet is back there for the picnic. Um, that would be held June 4th. Um, the other thing is, there are also sign up sheets for people who might be interested in giving tours of the blacksmith shop and the Pioneer House. Um, I've been doing it now for several years, it's really fun. Um, I, I love to, you know, meet the people um, of around the point. Uh, so many don't even know about the houses and they come through and they say, wow, you know, I've seen it, but I've never really been inside. And uh, so we're, you know, we're always looking for volunteers to help with that. Um, and lately we've been just doing it on the farmer market night. Um, so, um, so we don't tie up people's weekends and things like that. And also probably for uh, the 4th of July um, events will we'll be open for that. So there are sign-up sheets. So at the end of um, our program, 
uh, please feel free to, to go up and sign up. And we also will have refreshments in the back after the program. I'm sure everybody's very anxious to get to the sea breeze, so here we go. Um, Kevin Dory is a historian at Sea Breeze Amusement Park in Irondequoit. He is an educator and avid amusement park enthusiast with a passion for history. Kevin has been actively researching and documenting Sea Breeze for the past seven years. He enjoys <coughs> talking with people about their memories of Sea Breeze, as well as viewing their photographs, home movies, and memorabilia from the park. So welcome, Kevin, and uh, enjoy the Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening, and I want to thank the Irondequoit Historical Society um, for inviting me to come this evening to share one of my favorite stories, the story of Seabreeze Amusement Park. Let's start with the most important question, who here has been to Seabreeze before? <laughs> Just about everybody. Oh my gosh, it's one of my favorite places to go in the summer. And you walk around what looks like a beautiful modern amusement park. It's hard to believe that it's been around for 143 years. The park opened in 1879. It's the fourth oldest operating amusement park in the country, the 13th oldest in the world. It's a real treasure. We're so blessed to have that right here in our own backyard. Tonight I'm going to share with you the story of Seabreeze, where it came from, what it looked like when it opened, and how it evolved into the favorite summertime playground that we enjoy today. With that said, shall we start? Yeah. 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 Let's do it. All right. It all started back in 1865 when a fellow named George Allen opened a hotel at Seabreeze, marking the start of the resort era. And folks would come up to Seabreeze and they just loved it. It was very popular. They would enjoy swimming, fishing, and boating on the lake and bay. The waters were clean and pristine. They'd climb up on the bluffs, have a picnic lunch, collect nuts and flowers, go back down to the hotel, enjoy the refreshments in the dining room, the live entertainment. It was really a spectacular place to go. There was one big problem, and that problem was accessibility. The route to Seabreeze was a primitive dirt road like this. And if you wanted to get to Seabreeze, you had to get in a horse and buggy and make your way up the road. Or if you were fortunate, maybe you could take a boat down the river or along the shore and arrive at the hotel that way. Within about 10 years, the first railroad came through. It was an east-west railroad, the Lake Ontario Shore Railroad. And it stopped right in front of George Allen's hotel, it connected the hotel with um, Charlotte on the west, and it continued over the bay outlet to points due east. And now all of a sudden, folks could really get to Seabreeze much more easily, and its popularity soared. In fact, George Allen had more business than he could handle, which is a terrific problem to have. And all of a sudden, hotels and resorts started springing up all over the place. There was another fellow who was well aware of the popularity of Seabreeze. It's this guy right here, Michael Phylon. Michael Phylon is the founder of Seabreeze Park, and he was the mayor of Rochester during the Civil War. He was also a local businessman. He was a carriage maker, and so transportation was in his blood. And in 1876, he went down to Philadelphia to the World Fair, and he saw a system of trains being used to transport people to and from the fairgrounds. And he got to thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had a train that directly connected Rochester with Seabreeze. He said, I bet it'd be very popular, and I bet we could make a ton of money. And he was bright on both accounts. He came back to Rochester, he found 41 investors, and he built what was called the Rochester and Lake Ontario Railroad, more commonly known as the Bay Railroad. And it started right down here um, on Portland Avenue, continued up to Ridge Road, and around Bishop Kearney High School, it made a route north um, and came right up here to Seabreeze, roughly following the route of the Seabreeze Expressway. The early trains um, looked like this. They were steam trains, and the six-mile journey took about 30 minutes. It stopped about halfway through at the Forest House so that passengers could buy refreshments, which was necessary um, as a part of the agreement to get the right-of-way to go across that property. The railroad had to agree to stop the trains there so people could buy their drinks, um, and so that's what they did. Folks packed into these train cars like sardines. Um, they couldn't 
fit the people in the cars, all of them that wanted to get up to Seabreeze. They were often hanging off the sides um, just to get up there. Um, a local pastor took note of this. He wrote an article in the Democrat and Chronicle. He was very upset. Um, he was trying to save everyone's souls, and he couldn't help but notice that the church pews were empty and the Bay Railroad trains were full. Um, he was furious. So what did he do? Well, he talked to the folks who ran the railroad, and they agreed to let him put a tent up at the park. So on Sunday, all those sinful people who were going to Arondequit Bay, they could go up to the bay to enjoy the day, but they could also fulfill their religious obligations. <laughs> at the end of the railroad um, was this beautiful park that you see here. Today we call it Seabreeze Park. Back then it was called Seabreeze Grove. And it doesn't look very much like the park that we know today. There's no merry-go-rounds or roller coasters or water slides or anything like that. In the earliest days, Seabreeze was very much a picnic park. And you'd go up there, you'd enjoy the landscaping, um, walk along the paths, have a picnic lunch. There was a pavilion uh, with a refreshment stand. You could get food, drink, and most importantly, cigars. And it was just a great place to go. Kind of for perspective, right over here is the train station. And that was where, um, that's roughly in the area where the refreshment stand is today. So the carousel today is right over in this area here. So for perspective, you can picture where that was. You'll notice off to the side here, there's a little white sign. I don't know if you can see that in the back, but that was the entrance to the picnic grove. There was a giant ravine that bisected the park. And the picnic grove, which was on the edge of Arondequoit Bay, right up on the bluff, was connected to the rest of the park um, by this giant bridge. And when you crossed over the bridge, uh, what you saw was this. Um, pretty much everything you'd expect a picnic grove to have. It would have benches, picnic tables, this building here, which was called the Grove Hotel. Um, you could purchase refreshments there. You could also borrow silverware and plates for your picnic because disposable plates were not a thing in the 1800s. <laughs> and it pretty much had everything you could possibly want. There were ball diamonds, athletic fields, um, thousands of people, four, five, six thousand people on a Sunday um, could pile into this grove and there was plenty of space for everyone. Here's a later view of that grove with some of the buildings uh, around the 1920s. And about that time, the old bridge had to be replaced and they decided to build an earth causeway through there instead. So they hauled some dirt in and made a path right through. That path actually exists in the park today um, there's a path that connects the water park and the amusement park together. That's that same area where that bridge once was. You might notice in the background here, there's all kinds of water slides and attractions. That's the area that was once the grove. Today, that is the water park. It features a wave pool, a lazy river, lots of water slides and other um, attractions to keep it cool on a hot summer day. Around the edges in the back here and down on the side over here, there are still picnic groves. You can still bring your picnic basket to Seabreeze today, just like you could in 1879, if you really want to pack a lunch and bring it out to the park when you're going out to visit. Now, if we go back out into the main park and we turn and look the other way, facing um, Lake Ontario, what you would see is this beautiful hotel. This was the second of three hotels on the park property. Um, the Pavilion Hotel, built in 1888. And this was a wonderful place to stop. Um, they had a huge dining room overlooking the lake. They'd open those windows and the nice cool breezes would come right in. And it was quite refreshing. They would have acts, vaudeville acts, concerts, um, orchestras, all kinds of things in that hotel. It was really a great place to go. I should mention that a hotel back then is not like the Best Western or the Hilton of today. The hotels at that time were largely places for entertaining and they would serve food and drink and have, you know, um, different types of performances there. Of course, they did have a room or two or maybe five or ten, but um, the hotels were a little different than we have today when we think of a hotel. You'll notice right over here, there's a little uh, white blob. That's the top of a fountain um, that sat in front of that hotel. The fountain itself isn't particularly significant. But I want you to keep that in the back of your head because we'll see it a few times as we go through. The hotel burned down in 1909, um, as did a lot of early buildings. They didn't have fire suppression systems like we do today. And so that was lost um, in 1909. 
Today, um, that is the site of the Whirlwind roller coaster. So when you're riding on the Whirlwind, you're right in the area where that hotel was located. Across the street, um, that's Culver Road, right on the other side of the roller coaster, you see Lake Ontario, which is beautiful. At this time, there were many hotels down there, one of which was the Lakeshore Hotel. And you might notice there's a steamboat pier. Now, the folks who ran the park, the park was free admission. They made their money by people taking the train. And so you might wonder, what did they think about the steamboat pier? Well, fear not, they own the steamboat pier too. <laughs> they got your money no matter what. When the boats came in, they had to pay a fee. And the folks who invested in the railroads also had investments in the steamboat companies. Um, so they were making money no matter how you got up to sea rates. In the 1800s, a day at Seabreeze Park often meant lunch in the grove and then some time down at the beach. You might go for a swim um, and visit any of the hotels that were down there. They all had different things going on. There were no rides in the beginning in the amusement park proper, but there were some early attractions at Seabreeze, um, including this early merry-go-round, which was down on the lakeshore. There was also an early roller coaster that opened in 1886. I've never seen a picture of it. I would love to. Uh, maybe you have one in a shoebox somewhere, but um, they did have some early attractions down on the lakeshore. Now, going back into the park, for the first 20 years, things were going fantastic. Um, the trains were full, people were swarming up there. It was really a, a spectacle, it was wonderful. And then in 1899, on the morning of, I believe it was April 30th, um, there was a tragedy. One of the trains was coming down Portland Avenue and the brakes failed. And there were emergency brakes on the train, but unfortunately the fellow who was supposed to operate the emergency brakes was out collecting tickets on the train. And the engine made it around that turn, but the first car toppled off the track. A hundred people were injured and two people were killed. The railroad was found negligent and that was the end of the Rochester and Lake Ontario Railroad. They were forced into bankruptcy. By the next year, a new company was formed, the Rochester and Suburban Railway, and that brought in the era of the electric trolley. So that's where the electric trolleys came from. Now, you might think it's a fairly simple task to convert from a steam line to an electric trolley line, and by all means, it probably should be. You run some electrical wires and get some new cars. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in 1879, folks were very eager to have the railroad come through their property because they believed it gave them some value to the property. But by the time 1900 rolled around, they knew how much money that railroad was making, and they needed to get new right-of-ways for the power lines. And so everyone wanted to take money, and those negotiations took a lot of months. But by Memorial Day, the park was open and ready to go once again. They breathed new life into the park, new buildings, new landscaping, painted everything fresh, and they renamed the park Seabreeze Park. And that's where the name Seabreeze Park came from. They also started a new business model where previously everything was owned by the railroad. Um, now they would let concessionaires come in. So if you wanted to open a popcorn stand or a fortune teller's booth or bring in a merry-go-round, all you had to do was talk to the park manager and they would set you up with a lease and off you would go. And that's how the first amusement rides came in. The first amusement ride came in in 1903. Does anyone know what that ride was? Oh boy, I don't feel confident here. <laughs> the first ride was um, a roller coaster, not the Jackrabbit, but an earlier roller coaster called the Figure Eight. Um, the figure eight was a very simple roller coaster by today's standards. Um, it had a very gently sloping track, a few small dips, nothing too extreme. Um, but back in 1903, that was really a thriller. That same year, um, they installed a laughing gallery, which is, you know, those funhouse mirrors that distort your image into all sorts of weird shapes. Um, one of those. And they also installed a petting zoo in the Grove. And the newspapers are interesting to read because the number of rabbits increases at a very fast rate. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. If we back up a little bit further, 1904, this new building here was built. That is a carousel building. Um, that carousel was brought by a man named George Long, who was associated with the park for many years. The Long family was in the carousel business since the 
late 1800s, they built and operated carousels all around the country, and they brought one here to Seabreeze in 1904. This little boy right down here in the front with a hat, um, that is George's son, George Jr. And I mentioned him because as the years would go on, he spent most of his life at Seabreeze. He would go on to become the park manager in the 1930s. In the 1940s, he would buy the park um, from the trolley company. And today it's his grandchildren and great-grandchildren who own and operate the park. <laughs> now the merry-go-round isn't in this spot anymore for reference. Um, that's where the Jackrabbit station is located. So when you hop on the Jackrabbit next time, you're standing right in that spot where that early merry-go-round was. And just a little bit further down toward the big hill on the Jackrabbit, that's where that early roller coaster was. One little thing I'd like to show folks in that picture that we saw a moment ago is that water tower in the back. That was a tower for the park's waterworks system. And what they did is they had a spring that collected um, down by Rondequoit Bay. They had a little basin. They pumped the water up into this tower so that the picnickers and the concessionaires could have running water at the park. Now they said the water was medicinal. If you came to Seabreeze Park, you could get great health if you drink this water. <laughs> of course, I'm sure that was true. Um, but um, that is the story of the waterworks system. Yeah. Now as time goes on, it's still very much a picnic park with a couple of rides. In 19, oh, I didn't show you this with you. I almost forgot about this. These uh, concrete footings here by the jackrabbit, those are the footings for that water tower. So those are still there in the park. Um, so when you're getting in line and you're waiting to get on, you'll see those concrete footings. Those are from that water tower. And now the rides keep coming. 1906, a circle swing came in. This was a large tower that had huge steel cables suspended from it. And these little cars were attached. It would swing around, giving the sensation of flight. And that was a really popular ride in amusement parks all around the country. Over here on the side, you see the Grove, the uh, Pavilion Hotel. If we were to climb up into the Pavilion Hotel and look out across the midway, this is the view that we would see. There's that circle swing right over there and that fountain. And down around the bend down here, that's the trolley station. That's where folks would get on and off of the trolleys when they came to the park. That view looks a little bit different today, um, but similar in some ways. Right over here is where that hotel was and the circle swing was where the Revolution ride is. In the background here are the games and the refreshment stand. That is where you would get on to the trolley. And then the bobsleds right on the side here. You'll notice the merry-go-round is right over in this spot here with the big red roof. Um, it's been in that spot since about 1915. That's where they moved the merry-go-round to that year. And they moved the carousel from that other end and they took that other roller coaster out and built a new roller coaster. 1916, the dips. This was a much bigger roller coaster than the original was. Um, it had bigger drops, faster speeds, longer trains of cars. You might notice that there's some little dragon heads on the front of the cars. Those are actually in the parks museum today. And this was really a, uh, a neat ride. It operated up until around 1933. Of course, it is not with us any longer. Um, you'll notice this building in the front here, though. Um, that's where you would get on and off of the roller coaster. That building still exists at the park today. It is the uh, bumper car building. <laughs> so when you hop on the bumper cars, you're exactly where you can get on and off of that early roller coaster. It's interesting because you walk around the park and you don't realize how much history there is all around you. And it's really neat to see that. Now, I should mention that Seabreeze did not operate in isolation. There were other things to do, right? You might come to Seabreeze Park for the picnics or for the free shows. They had acts and performances every day. They had their own hotels. You might you know, partake in the rides, but there were a lot of other things to do. There were other hotels and there were other amusement parks. Right next door to Seabreeze Park was Carnival Court, which opened in 1917. A lot of folks fondly remember the old Ferris wheel that was up at Seabreeze. That was at Boardwalk Park, which was the evolution of Carnival Court. So this was right next door with all sorts of attractions. If you were to go just along the lakeshore a few miles into Charlotte, you would see Ontario Beach Park. And that was really the big amusement park in town. Um, and they had three roller coasters and a fun house and merry-go-rounds and, and all kinds of great attractions. 
And that was really the big name in amusement parks in Rochester until the end of 1919 um, when the park closed. And that opened a new opportunity for Seabreeze. By this time, a guy named Bert Wilson is running the show and he loves amusement parks and he has big visions for Seabreeze. And you're gonna notice over the next 10 years, a huge decade of, of growth. Here's the ad from 1920. Rochester's greatest summer amusement resort where there's pleasure and room for all, the playground of a thousand delights. Always something new, grand fireworks carnival, amusements and riding devices, bathing facilities unexcelled, pony track for the little tots, follow the crowds to Sea Breeze Park. And let me tell you, the crowds came. On a Sunday, it wasn't uncommon for there to be 20 or 30,000 people up in the Sea Breeze area enjoying the resorts and everything they had to offer. Here's an acrobat show out on the lawn and just look at all the people crowded around to see it. And this show would run two or three times a day. So massive numbers of people are coming up to Sea Breeze. The merry-go-round is just behind this tree. This is that trolley station and they're just crowded around to see. But it wasn't even the shows that were the big draw for that year. It was the new amusement rides that were really state of the art and exciting. Take a look at some of these. You might know this one, <laughs> the Jackrabbit. The Jackrabbit came in 1920. It was the fastest roller coaster in the world when it opened. And it employed a new track system where the cars were securely fastened to the track. Those earlier roller coasters, the cars just kind of sat on top of the track. These, the cars are fastened right to it, which means you can have steeper dips, faster speeds, and all kinds of crazy acrobatics, which is what we see on roller coasters today. If we go just off to the left, you would see the old mill, which is a Tunnel of Love style ride. It was never called the Tunnel of Love, but that's what it was. You'd get in a little boat and you'd ride through the dark tunnels. And you know, if you're with someone special, you might steal a kiss along the way, who knows? Um, but that was a great attraction in 1920 as well. Out in the Midway, this beautiful refreshment pagoda was built where you could get Liberty Root Beer, which was a popular beverage at the time. And you might notice in the background over there, there's a building under construction. That is the Dreamland Dance Hall. The Dreamland Dance Hall was quite the spectacle. It was the largest open air dancing pavilion in Western New York State. There was space for a thousand people out on the floor at a time. They had these beautiful arched ceilings, which meant there didn't need to be poles in the middle of the floor, completely unobstructed. And it was built over the ravine on pilings, <coughs> on poles. So when you were inside looking out, what you saw were the branches of the trees. And it was really a beautiful place to go. You could stop in for the day, or if you wanted, they had dances for 10 cents each. You could come or go as much as you wanted. Right next to the dance hall was a giant slide that went to the bottom of the ravine and underneath the dance hall, because it was built up, there was a labyrinth or a fun house that you could find your way out of called Hilarity Hall. 1921, the first bumper car ride comes to the park and it was called the Dodgem. And you'll notice right here, maybe you can see them, there are little lanterns hanging around the sides of the building. Um, those lanterns actually have been repurposed all over the park over the years. Today you can see those um, if you ride the train ride. They're illuminating the loading area for the train. <laughs> the airplane swing um, was brought in in 1921. You might think that looks a lot like the circle swing that we saw a few minutes ago. That's because it is. This is a new version of it, this time with airplane-themed cars. And at the other end of the park, a new roller coaster called the Virginia Reel. Now that's the dips in the background that you see there. We talked about that from 1916. But the Virginia Reel was an early spinning roller coaster. And you would hop into the cars. They were round tubs. They would go through the track. And you might notice there's like a gear around the bottom here. That would engage with slats on the track, causing it to spin and twirl along the way. Now the Virginia Reel operated until about 1930. And other things have stood there over the years. For perspective, um, that's this site right here where the Waffle Stand and the Music Express are today. 1922, a whip style ride. 
1923, a beautiful new stage. They continued to have those acts and performances every day at the park, um, two, three times a day. And they now had the stage with a nice little orchestra pit, um, and it was large so that they could accommodate pretty much any type of act that they wanted to. But the big news for 1923 was not the stage or the shows or the roller coasters or anything else. It was a fire that broke out in August of that year. One night as the park was closing down, um, smoke was seen coming from the old mill ride. Workers ran over and it very quickly spread. This area right in here, this is where the loading platform is for the jackrabbit. Um, you can see it's completely gone. This is actually the part that you see left here. This is the second hill going up. The old mill, which was the tunnel of log ride that went through here, um, that is completely gone. And worst of all, that beautiful dance hall is completely destroyed. It turned out that because the dance hall was built on the on the poles, that the air flowed right through it. And as soon as it caught fire, it just spread like wildfire. Um, two of the firefighters barely escaped with their lives, uh, but they did manage to keep the fire from spreading any further than it did. That next weekend, the biggest crowds of the seasons came to the park. Everybody wanted to see the ruins. I guess they didn't want to see it when it was in good shape, but they definitely wanted to see it when it was ruined. And so um, by that next week, um, they were back to rebuilding and cleaning things up. And by 1924, you'd barely know that anything was gone except for the fact that the ravine didn't have the dance hall over it. You'll notice here the jackrabbit station. Um, that's the configuration that the jackrabbit has today. Um, it's a larger loading area, which accommodated, better accommodated the crowds. If we go on the other side of the ravine and we look back this way, um, this is what we would see. You'll notice right over here, the jackrabbit, and then next to it is the rebuilt old mill station and a new dance hall in the back. So let's take a look at some of those, shall we? Here's the old mill, um, completely rebuilt. You can see those boats up close, what it was like, um, and they just kind of flowed through the gentle flowing waters. If that looks familiar to some of you, and it may, um, that's because in the 1930s, they converted this into a ride called the subway. And so this was actually the loading area for the subway um, in its early days. Just beyond this was a new ride called the Caterpillar. The cars go around over the, the track, and as it gets going, a canopy comes over and engulfs you in the Caterpillar's cocoon. <laughs> really a fun, unique ride. Now, if we climb up top of the Jackrabbit and look back, you would see the new dance hall, now called Dance Land. It's an exact replica of the one that burned down um, just the year prior, with one exception. They built it on flat land. They decided if, heaven forbid, the thing should catch fire again, they didn't want to have the same problem. So what they did is they built it on flat land, thinking it would make it a little bit more fire resistant or fireproof. And with that said, um, it was quite a popular place to go. Dance land was always busy. In fact, wait till you see the inside of this place. Really um, an amazing place. The beautiful chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, um, the large open dancing area that had a promenade around the edges for observers. And you can just picture what it would be like to have a thousand people dancing on the floor with the orchestra playing. It must have really been a sight to see. They had all sorts of competitions in here. They had a um, dance marathon where folks danced for more than 200 hours straight. Maybe you could do that, I don't think I could. They had um, a national contest for the All-American Dance Queen. They were gonna find the All-American Dance Queen. They had auditions in Chicago and everywhere around the country. And they had the Rochester auditions right here in Danceland. Now, if we go out the back side of Danceland, what you'd see is a big open field. And you could build all kinds of things back there. So what did they put? A beautiful swimming pool. Yeah, beautiful swimming pool. The Seabreeze Park Natatorium, the largest inland saltwater pool in the country. They would salt the water to match the Atlantic Ocean. Keep in mind in the 1920s, not a lot of people from Rochester were probably traveling to the Atlantic Ocean. So they salted it to match the ocean. They advertised it ocean bathing at the lakeside. And it was really a beautiful uh, complex. They sterilized the water with a filtration system that was state of the art. Um, they had a restaurant, 
They had 6,000 lockers. You could fit 5,000 people in the pool at a time. Really an amazing facility. They had diving platforms and springboards and little um, amusements like the water whip and the water wheel over here. In the other direction, they had this um, imposing structure, which was a water toboggan. You climb up to the top with your sled and go right down and skip out over the pool. Whoa. Hopefully nobody's in front of you. <laughs> they had a stage as well. They would have vaudeville acts, concerts out there every night. And the idea was that by having these performances, you know, they could fit 3,000 people in the bleachers. They thought, you know, whether people are swimming or not, maybe they'll come in for the entertainment. And a lot of folks went into the natatorium. They had bright lights that illuminated the night so you could swim on the hot days until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Wow. Here's an aerial view of that pool to give you an idea of how large it is. You'll notice the dance hall over here on the left by the railroad tracks. It looks tiny compared to the pool. It was really quite the, uh, quite the facility. This is a view from 1929. By this time, they've taken a section of the grove over here and converted it into a parking lot. People are now driving cars to the park. Because they were in the transportation business, they would charge you 25 cents to park your car. Today, parking's free. Right over here is a ride called the Tumble Bug. Um, you might know that as the Lightning Bug. We'll take a look at that in a little while. And over on the other side here, way at the top, is a new roller coaster called the Wildcat, which opened in 1926. The Wildcat didn't look like very much from the midway at all. Um, but once you got inside the loading area and you looked down into the ravine, it was actually quite a large roller coaster. It had a huge tunnel um, that it went flying through at the start, clickety-clack up the hill, around the curved drop, and then the drops, because it used the terrain so intelligently, actually became larger as the ride went on. The Wildcat operated for about 10 years. Um, it left during the Great Depression. For perspective, that is right in this spot today where the log flume is located. So when you ride on the log flume, you're actually right in that area where the wildcat once ran. Kids' rides have always been important at the amusement park. You have to have something for everybody. In 1926, they introduced Kitty Park, which featured um, a sand pile, some playground equipment, and some kids' rides as well, a small merry-go-round, a little swing ride and a tiny roller coaster. Never seen pictures of any of them, but they wrote about them in the newspapers. The Kitty rides today are roughly in this similar location in a section called Kitty City. Now, here's one that a lot of folks probably remember, the Philadelphia Toboggan Company Carousel. Interesting story, George Long actually had two carousels that he operated, one here in Seabreeze and one over at Seneca Park in Rochester. And by 1926, they decided that Seabreeze was the far more profitable and the far better operation. And so they decided during that winter to take the carousels apart a piece at a time. They would load up the pickup truck, drive the load over, load it back up, go back with another load. And by the time 1926 came around, this beautiful carousel um, called Seabreeze, it's home. This carousel had actually operated at Seneca Park for about 10 years by this time. Outside the carousel building was Smiling Pete Connors. Smiling Pete ran the Guess Your Weight booth, and for 10 cents, he would try to guess your weight. If he got it wrong, you won a box of chocolates. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, the problem is he was pretty good at it. I don't think he gave very many boxes of chocolates away. And there, there's a, um, an interview with him where he says, well, every now and then you have to guess wrong or nobody's going to play. But I think he could get most of them right each time. Uh, there were other attractions as well. This is the Japanese Bazaar. This is um, Mr. and Mrs. Ken Murai. They ran the Japanese Bazaar. They had all kinds of goods imported from Japan, porcelain, jewelry, and other things um, that you could pick up to remember your day out at Seabreeze. I mentioned the cars um, a couple of minutes ago. Folks were driving their cars to the park. In 1927, they started adding car-themed rides. And this is um, one called the Custer Cars. And it's a simple ride. You ride the car around an oval track. It was perfect for the kids who wanted to be able to drive their own car. The adults could ride it too. It was a real family attraction. In 1927, they also did a major remodel to the Dips roller coaster that was built in 1916. They reconfigured the layout, made it a more thrilling ride. 
I don't know much more about it than that, um, but that's um, something else that was happening in 1927. Now, this is a view of 1929. We're at the turn of the um, decade once again. By this time, the Dodgem building has been converted to a dark ride called Giggles, where things jump out at you and, and scare you along the way. And right over here, just past the Jackrabbit, is a new ride called the Lindy Loop. It was at about this time when the concessionaires started experimenting with different price points. Um, everything at this point was 10 or 15 cents. They decided to do an experiment to see for two days what the effect would be if they made everything a nickel. Would it be more profitable? Would the rides have more riders? Um, what would happen? And it was so successful that for the rest of 1929 and then through the depression, five cents was the name of the game. They started bringing in some unusual attractions, um, animal exhibits, and here's a couple of stories for you. You notice this guy down in the bottom right here. His name is Oswas. He was a giant red-haired ape. The Shriners used to have their carnival at Seabreeze Park. Um, the, many of the men who ran the park were members of the Shrine, and so they'd have the carnival up there. They'd put up special decorations and bring in special exhibits. And one of those exhibits was Oswas, and the kids loved Oswas. Unfortunately, Oswas didn't like them very much. <laughs> um, he did not like being in captivity. And um, regrettably, his life was very short in captivity. Um, but he was so popular that the folks who were in the park got to thinking, and they asked the guy who owned the ape if they could purchase the taxidermied animal to put on display in the museum. And so that's what they did. Oswas found his afterlife in the museum. And the museum was instantly more popular than it ever had been before. Um, people lined up for miles to get into this museum. They even doubled the price from five cents to 10 cents. <laughs> they also had a reptile tent. The reptile tent had things like Chinese dragons, alligators. You could see the alligator fed every night at 945, which at that time was a real, uh, real thing to see. And they had a giant python in there, which brings us to our next story. The Sea Breeze Snake Scare. <laughs> this is a coloring page from the newspaper. One morning in 1930, the workers arrived at the reptile tent, ready for the day, and they noticed somebody was missing. <laughs> that somebody was the snake. <laughs> and they said, oh my gosh, the snake is missing. They looked all over. You know, they looked under buildings, they looked in the trees, anywhere a snake might go and hide. They, um, they looked. They couldn't find it. Now word got out, and the people in Irondequoit were terrified. They brought their kids in, they shut the shutters, locked the doors, nobody went out. If we have a fear of snakes here in town, it might be the fault of secrets. For nine days, they searched for this snake. For nine days. We saw the snake in the ravine. Everyone went down there and cut down all the brush. There was no snake. We saw the snake in Durand Eastman Park. Everyone ran to Durand Eastman Park. No snake to be found. Then one morning, nine days later, one of the concessionaires is walking by the fortune teller's booth and he hears a sound. Um, he says, oh my gosh, is it the snake? He gets on his hands and knees. He looks under there. There he sees its eyes looking right at him. He runs and gets the park manager. Here's the park manager. He picks up his crowbar and he picks up his rifle and he goes running down to that fortune teller booth, rips the floor up, and there's the snake. Now, the guy right here, he owned the snake. He said, don't shoot my snake. I want my snake back. The park manager said, everyone in this town is terrified of your snake. They think it's running loose. If you put it back in its cage, they're going to think you just bought a new one. So they shot it through the head, oh. sat it into that story, put it on display on the stage so everybody could come out and see that it was safe now, and that was the end of the snake. Now, they did taxidermy and put it on display in the reptile tent, so you could still go and see it throughout the year. The manager of the park had been working over the last 10 years to develop an amusement center on par with Coney Island in New York City. He wanted an amusement park that would be worthy of national recognition. That's where he got his national recognition. This snake showed up in newspapers all around the country. <laughs> Everyone heard of the snake. Now, the times are changing. 1930, 
Great Depression. People would come out to the park during the 20s and spend money very freely. But now the economics aren't quite the same as they were. People are unemployed. They have to choose between feeding their family or riding the roller coaster. And I'm sure you know which one they probably choose. They feed their family. So during the 1930s, some attractions are coming in, but they're not coming in on the scale that they were. One attraction that came in 1930 was this um, swing ride, the Mary Mix-Up. That same year, a fire ripped through the, the north end of the park and took out this whole area of concessions here. By the way, that's where that fortune teller's booth was right there at the end, uh, where the snake was. And it destroyed all of those concessions. They decided not to rebuild the, Gin the Virginia Reel, but they did rebuild the concessions underneath. They put in an archery um, attraction, um, shuffleboard, a ski ball, some arcade games. 1931, this beautiful organ came to the park to play music at the carousel. We all know that sound, right? Mm -hmm. 1932, the airplane swing was sold at auction. Um, the caterpillars were moved from the park. The offerings are getting fewer and fewer. In 1933, another fire. It ripped through those attractions that had just been rebuilt. And this time it took the dips or the Greyhound roller coaster with it. That was the end of the roller coaster. And so by this point, things are looking pretty grim. The trolley company is in bankruptcy. They don't have the money to invest in the park. And people aren't spending great amounts of money because they don't have it to spend. And so things are looking pretty dire. By the end of 1935, the beginning of 1936, even more attractions are leaving. The Wildcat was removed at the end of 1935, leaving the Jackrabbit as the only roller coaster left. Keep in mind, a couple years earlier, there were four of them. The Natatorium, the giant pool, was deemed not profitable, and the trolley company petitioned the bankruptcy court to abandon it, and they auctioned off the equipment, raised the structures, and left the pool to fill with rainwater. And the Depression did in a lot of amusement parks around the country. And it's perhaps a miracle, or maybe it's the dedication of the folks who were running the park at the time, that it still exists today. But in 1937, they were looking for a new person to run the park, and they turned to this guy. Do you remember the little boy in front of the merry-go-round? <laughs> there he is. He's all grown up. He's 45 years old now. And um, he becomes the manager of the park. He gave the park a new name. Do you know what that name was? <laughs> Dreamland Park. You got it. Renamed it Dreamland Park and began a new decade of leadership where they brought in new attractions, refreshed the park, and breathed new life into it. Wait till you see the kinds of things they did. They began by installing all sorts of new attractions. They went down to the ravine where the wildcat once was, flooded it, and built this boat ride for the kids. They built a new kids ride, a horse and buggy ride. This photo is later than 1937, but you see these two kids who are on the ride there? Those are two of George Long's grandchildren, Anne and George. Um, they're two of the siblings who own and operate the park today. Also in 1937, one you might remember, the subway. Mm -hmm. They went to the old mill, drained out the water, put a metal plate on the bottom, replaced the boats with a high-speed tractor with cars, and it would go barreling through the dark tunnels in um, a very popular attraction. An interesting note about the subway is you'll notice these cars here. They have those dragon heads on the front. These are the same cars that operated on the Dips roller coaster that opened in 1916. Um, they survived the fire in 1933, and they repurposed them here on the subway. Up above the subway was an animatronic woman named Giggling Nerdy. She would laugh and cackle all day long. She probably drove the workers nuts. Um, but there she was. She certainly probably drew a lot of attention to the subway, and she was up there for many years as well. In 1938, a new bumper car ride was installed. This is in that roller coaster station um, where the bumper cars are today. They also brought in a couple of animal attractions. They brought in an alligator farm. Um, as well as an attraction called the Jungle, which featured monkeys and, and some other um, animals in it. 
Also in 1938, a new ride called the Thunderbolt, which was a new version of the Caterpillar, um, very much identical to the one that operated at the park earlier in the 1920s, uh, but they brought another one back in. 1939, the ghost train, um, like a haunted spook house, get in the car, go through the dark, little things jump out and scare the heck out of you. That was a popular one for a lot of years. And then this here, Long's Dreamland Inn. This was a restaurant, and it's not special because it was a restaurant, although you could go there and have your anniversary party or, or a meeting, whatever you wanted to have there. Um, it's special because this is one of the first buildings that was built in the park. It was at the park at least in 1900 as a picnic pavilion. I suspect, although I don't have proof, I suspect it was actually at the park in 1879 as the original pavilion. Um, this building actually still exists at the park today. It is the park's administrative office building. And then a tragedy. Dance land. Do you remember I said they built it on flat land so it wouldn't burn as well? It didn't help any. Um, dance land was a complete loss in 1940. And by that time, there weren't a whole lot of dances being held. At that point, it was largely used for bingo games by the VFW. And they needed a new place for the bingo games. And they asked George Long if he would be constructing another dance hall. And he said, absolutely. And the town was very quick to say, well, you know, we're kind of tired of fighting these fires. Um, so if you're going to build a new dance hall, it best to be fireproof. Now, George Long was a clever man. So what did he do? Well, he knew he had that abandoned swimming pool in the back. So he went out back, he flattened out the bottom, and he built walls right up on the sides of the old natatorium pool, converting it into a building. And that became the bingo hall. It served various purposes over the years. Um, it did the, they had you know, some kind of dances in there. They had the bingo games. They used it as a bottling plant at one time, um, leased it out for that. And today it's the park's warehouse building. You can actually see the pool tiles right on the side of the building if you get up close to it. And this is what that building looks like today. If you go on the inside, you can actually still see the pool tiles and the gutters right in the walls. Um, it's really, really cool. And this is what the end of the park looks like in the 1940s. You might remember in the 20s, there was the airplane swing and the caterpillar and the dance hall and the natatorium. The, the um, tumblebug was down there. It was really a busy place. By 1940, there's really nothing down there. It's become a parking lot. The fun has moved elsewhere in the park. And they bring in all sorts of attractions in the years coming up. Right next to the jackrabbit, they had a giant moon rocket ride high-speed um, rocket cars go around a circle at a sharp angle. Around 1942, the flying scooters came in, and that actually exists at the park today, my favorite ride, truth be told. <laughs> and at the other end of the park, a miniature golf course, and it had all the classic stunts. It had a windmill to hit your ball through, um, the ball to shoot, the wall to shoot through, and all those kinds of things there. Here's an actual picture of the miniature golf course. You might notice the fountain over here on the right-hand side. Um, that's that fountain from in front of the hotel. And you might notice hanging up above are those lanterns that we saw long ago over by the bumper car building, the Dodge back in 1921. Just outside of the mini golf course was the Sky Ride. This is the third version of the circle swing to come to the park. The second one was sold off during the Depression. This time, instead of airplane cars, it features rocket ship cars, and it's elevated up on a building, so it's a little bit higher up. It must have had beautiful views of the lake, because the lake is just beyond it. Um, must have been quite the place to, uh, to go riding. Here's a view of the Midway around 1942. You'll see the popcorn stand right over here, and then the Thunderbolt on the right, miniature golf in the back. There's that tall sky ride right there. The ghost train is here. There's a ride in the back called the Heyday, which is a whip-like ride. And then there's this thing right in the front here. Um, that's the Lupo plane. That's how you could get upside down in the 1940s. <laughs> I can just picture everyone's change falling out. Because everyone had coins back then, right? 
If we back up a little bit more, you'll see the very popular lightning bug. Mm -hmm. The lightning bug operated for many years up until around 1970. You rode in these circular tubs over an, a um, track that had a few hills in it, and it went at high speeds, flinging you around the car as you went. There were once these rides all around the country. Today, there's only one left down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So if you want to ride the lightning bug for nostalgia, you're gonna have to go down to Kennywood in Pittsburgh. Now, things slowed down for World War II. Efforts were focused on the war. But once the war was over, um, things picked up again back at Dreamland Park. In 1947, a giant train ride was built. The train was 2,000 feet long. It went through the grove, right along the bluff overlooking Irondequoit Bay. It was so popular that the next year they doubled the length from 2,000 feet to 4,000 feet. Right next to this train ride was a giant stage. For perspective, this is where the water park is today, and the log flume or over the falls was right over here. And you can see, um, you could really accommodate some huge crowds in here. There's pictures of that stage with multiple horses on it when they would do Western shows um, to give you a perspective of how large that stage was. George Long knew that the free performances were a big draw in the park. And when they didn't have professional acts coming in, they would actually have amateur nights where you could sign up to do your performance at Dreamland Park and they would do voting and you could win a week long contract um, to perform at the park. 1948, Tilt the World, that's still there today. 1949, a little kids roller coaster. And here's one you might remember, the Goofy House. That's, just, that's one that's special. The Goofy House took on many different forms over the years, um, as a dark walkthrough and later as a fun house. In these versions, you went in through the barrel, up the shifting stairs, along the rollers, through the 45 degree room, along the mirrors that twist and distort your body, and then the best part, perhaps, down the big slide at the end. Everyone loved the Goofy House. Mm -hmm. 1950, the Dreamland Park fire engine. You could ride this little fire engine all around the park, mostly made for the kids. You'll notice there's a monkey in the back here. That monkey is Dreamer Boy. Dreamer Boy was a bit of a celebrity around Rochester around 1950. He'd go to all the kids' events, um, and he would spend the summer at Dreamland Park where they proclaimed him the Kitty Fire Chief. They could have used him a few years earlier. <laughs> Another way to get around the park um, was the Dreamland Park trolley. You could pay your ticket and you just ride the trolley around. You could get on or off or along the route um, or just take in the scenery. We talk a lot about the rides, but there's a lot more to Seabreeze than just the rides. And here's a, a picture of the games. This picture is probably from around 1960. By this time, the mini golf has moved back a little bit. You'll notice what was the fountain is now a flower planter. And you'll see there's that fire truck right there. Three in line, which is like a tic-tac-toe, the dart game, play ball with Charlie, ski ball. There have been games at the park since the early 1900s of all sorts, and there still are today. Um, here's a few modern views. You can still play the Sea Breeze Derby. The very first version of that um, was in the park no later than 1910. Play ball with Charlie. Well, it's now called Knock It Off. Um, you can test your, uh, your arm to see if you can knock those milk jars off with uh, the baseball. Dart game. And in fact, there's a whole midway of games at the park today. This looks like one beautiful modern building. Um, but it's actually many buildings pieced together. These buildings have been at the park since 1910 or earlier. And if you're inside of the buildings, you can actually see how they're pieced together. It's really interesting. There were other attractions besides games and rides as well. Here's one you might remember, uh, Fairyland, which was largely a petting zoo. Mother Goose was all the rage in the 1950s, and Dreamland Park had its own Mother Goose-themed attraction. And You'd go in through the old woman's shoe and you could see Goosey Goosey Gander or Little Bo Peep Sheep. You could sit on the uh, elephant or look in the weshing well and you know what the best part of the whole fairyland was? The giant whale, the big blue whale that you'd climb into and look out into the pond through the window and see the fish swimming in the back. 
A lot of people remember Willie the Whale. 1954, Junior Coaster. Um, George Long, I didn't tell you this, but I'll go now. George Long was a construction guy at heart. He built more than 800 houses for Kodak. Um, he built many structures at the park. And he even was the um, contractor for um, the construction of a, a roller coaster in Delaware. Um, so building a roller coaster to him was probably nothing. And he decided in 1954 to build a family attraction, a roller coaster that the children and the adults could enjoy together. And it's a simple figure eight style ride. Um, very, very basic, but you'll notice it's bigger than the little kids roller coasters typically are. And you'll see in this picture of these cars, you'll see you have adults and children riding together. And that's what this ride was all about. If this looks slightly familiar to you, um, it might be because this was converted into the bobsleds in the 1960s. And so the entire layout of that junior coaster is contained within the bobsleds, plus more because they built it higher and wider. Um, we'll talk about the bobsleds in another minute or two. <coughs> Over the Falls, 1958, a water chute ride. You'd ride in your wooden boat through the tunnels, around the twists and turns, up the hill, and over the plunge. And Over the Falls was a really popular ride. Um, here's a picture of the entrance in um, the early 80s, I believe it was. Today it looks a little bit different. Today that's the entrance to the log flume. In 1984, they converted Over the Falls to a more modern flume ride. Greater elevation change. They had some rapids along the way, fiberglass logs, which require a little less uh, maintenance than a wood boat does in the water. But they did keep the best part of Over the Falls, that giant drop. Um, you can still ride that today on the log flume. Just outside of Over the Falls were these kiddie rides, a kiddie merry-go-round, the Thunderbird cars, which came in 1958, and a little roller coaster in the background. No idea when that came. Um, kiddie rides have been important for many years, and today, that's the home of Kitty City. They have all sorts of kids' attractions in there today. The swing ride that came in 1988. They also have the Thunderbird cars, which are still there. The turtles, and perhaps the most famous and popular of all, the kiddie boats. <laughs> Everyone remembers the kiddie boats. They came to the park in 1949. They've been loved ever since. Here's a picture of the kiddie boats in the 1950s. Different era, because you'll notice there's not a fence around the ride back then. Um, today there is. And you can see all kinds of neat stuff in the background. In the back here you have the Goofy House and a refreshment stand. And right over here, you had a large penny arcade. Let's take a look inside the arcade, shall we? Yeah. Let's go in. Here we go. Um, first thing that jumps out at me are those lanterns hanging from the ceiling. They're back again. <laughs> there they are. This is a section of the arcade that had some of the old classic machines in it, um, where you'd put your, your penny in, you'd get your little fortune card to tell you what was going to happen in your love life or, or whatever else. I'm sure it was accurate. Um, one that many folks remember, Fascination. Roll your ball down the court. It's like a bingo, five in a row, you win the prize. And the prizes are, are certainly interesting. Vacuum cleaner, um, ironing board, fan. Um, I don't know, they don't, they don't jump out at me, but I guess some people must have liked them. Or that's all that's left, I don't know. Just outside of the arcade, uh, right over here, is the tractor ride. The tractor ride only operated for about a year. Um, kids could drive their own little gas-powered tractor around the track. Um, I suspect, I don't know this for a fact, this is my guess. My guess is they probably spent more time crashed into the walls um, than they did going in, a, in the circle, looking at how the little kids drive the bumper cars is any indicator. Um, they only operated for one year. And then here's an important piece of Seabreeze history that's often overlooked. In the 1950s, we were building interstate highways all around the country. And we built the highway right up to Seabreeze. And we very much, when we did that, built that highway through there, reconfigured the whole end of the bay here. It's completely different than it was. Up until this time, this area was lined with hotels and amusements and attractions. 
And when the highway came through, that kind of marked the end of the resort era as it was. And that's an interesting story in and of itself. The highway also came right through the park. It went through the nat what was the natatorium. The building that remains is actually triangular shaped um, because the bulk of it was taken where the highway went through. And it went right through what was the picnic groves. They took about a third of the park's land to build that highway through there. And George Long, of course, was none too happy about that, but there wasn't a whole lot he could do about it. And so they just kept on going, and that's what he did. This is a view of the south end of the park in the 1950s. The subway looks a little bit different there. You've got the jackrabbit, the flying scooters, the refreshment stand from 1920. There's the tilt-a-whirl. And there's one we didn't talk about yet, right in the background there. Um, that's the Rocco plane. The Rocco plane was kind of like a Ferris wheel, except the cars had a brake on them, and you could lock it into place so you could flip upside down as you went through. Now, of course, you were strapped in better than you are on a Ferris wheel, uh, but certainly a real thriller of a ride um, that a lot of folks enjoyed. At the other end of the park, you'll notice that miniature golf course is moved down here. There's a restaurant right up here. There's the fountain, which was taken out in the 60s sometime. Merry-go-round, there's that building that we talked about, that's the park's office building. They actually rotated it 90 degrees around 1958 and moved it into its current position. Refreshment stand, which is where the trolleys were. The trolley stopped coming in 1936. They went to buses at that point. So refreshment stands moved into the old trolley station forevermore. And your Fairyland Zoo, Junior Coaster, and the Ferris wheel. There's that Ferris wheel that many people remember. Um, part of Boardwalk Park that was originally Carnival Court that opened in 1917. Here's a view of the Midway around 1960, and I want to point out this new ride brought in in 1958, the Crazy Cups, known as the Tea Cups to many people. Those were a lot of fun. They went around in a figure eight pattern, always a good time on the Tea Cups, um, as long as you don't get dizzy. Now, the Tea Cups, um, they eventually wore out, but the teacups were so popular that a new version of the teacups were brought in. So you can still ride the teacups today when you go out to Sea Breeze. 1960, all aboard, we're going sailing on the Delta Queen. The Delta Queen was a paddle wheel boat. It's called the Delta Queen Showboat. Um, would be a lot of fun, except that it was in the little pond in the middle of Over the Falls. Um, it didn't have very much space. So it had the little motorboat ride that we saw put in in 1937. The kids are buzzing around, and the Delta Queen's trying to make its way around as well. Um, there really wasn't much space for the Delta Queen. It would probably be great in a large pond or maybe a lake, uh, but it didn't work out so well down here. But fear not, it did find life later as a refreshment stand. <laughs> there it is. It now lives in the Midway, where you can buy popcorn and cotton candy for 15 cents each. In 1961, George Long went to Disneyland. Who doesn't want to go to Disneyland, right? Off he goes to Disneyland, Anaheim, California. And while he's there, he saw a new roller coaster that had just been built called the Matterhorn Bobsleds. And the Matterhorn Bobsleds were state of the art. They used a tubular steel for the track, which was a new invention for roller coasters. And it was great because you could make sharp twists and turns in ways that you couldn't with angle iron steel. He was so fascinated by the bobsleds that he saw in California that he decided he wanted his own. So he came back and he designed his own version of the bobsleds that he built on the junior coaster. He took the junior coaster, built it taller, made it wider, and developed his own version of that ride. And that's the bobsleds that we know today. Uh, really a cool ride, really unique, and the second roller coaster ever to use that tubular steel track. Really, really, um, really cool. This is the entrance of the bobsleds today. Um, just take a look at this midway for a moment. It's beautiful, isn't it? Like, look at the colors, the signs, the flowers, the trees, um, the rides, and look at all the people out having fun, the families. Really a, a lovely place. That's what Sea Breeze is like today. Um, Love going out there in the summertime. I suspect you probably do too. Uh, really a beautiful spot. 
Now, in the 1960s, things are slowing down. Things are slowing down a bit. Um, in the early 1960s, the go-karts came in, and within a few years, it was converted into the hot rods, which was the cars that you could drive around the track. And in 1970, a new ride called the paratrooper came in, and you can see the hot rods in the background with the bobsleds. There's that Rocco plane. You see this building here, the orange and yellow building? You know what that is? That's Carlos Tacos. That's the new uh, version of the Delta Queen. Delta Queen is now a taco stand. <laughs> In 1972, the Kaleidoscope. That was a remake of the subway. They removed the subway and um, put electric cars in there. They had an eight track tape that would play music as you went through the different scenes. Um, a psychedelic light show. And now the future is a little bit uncertain. In 1973, this article ran in the Times Union. Dreamland Park, end may be near. George Long said, you know, business is decent enough, but things are getting expensive. Taxes are up, costs are up. Um, I'm talking to developers, and I'm talking to a few different developers, and they we're considering building high-rise apartments or maybe a plaza, and the park will open next year, and it might even open the year after that, but the days are numbered. And we almost lost our beautiful park. Thank goodness um, for George Long's grandchildren and children who stepped up and said, we want to run the park. We want to take the park into a new era. We want to make it a wonderful family park, and that's what they did. These are George Long's grandchildren in a, in a modern photo. These are the men and women who have led the park for the last 40 or 45 years. Of course, they grew up in the park. They've been there all their lives. Um, but it's through their leadership and their vision that we have the beautiful park that we do today. And wait till you see the transformation over the next years. They began with a new mascot called Sea Breezy. Sea Breezy was an inventor who came to the park with new ideas and innovations. He flew into the Rochester airport, there was great fanfare, and here he was. The first attraction that Sea Breezy introduced was perhaps the most famous in all of Sea Breezy's history, the gyrosphere. Everyone remembers the gyrosphere. Go in through the tunnel, through the revolving door, into the inflatable dome, hop on board the scrambler ride, once you're all buckled in, the lights go off, the music starts playing, and the light show is projected on the ceiling. And it's one of the most loved attractions in, in all of 143 years. The gyrosphere operated for more than 30 years, was incredibly popular. Um, by 2007, its time had come, and they replaced it with a new music-themed ride called the Music Express. In 1978, Campbell Soup. Who doesn't want to ride the Campbell Soup can? You, your choice, minestrone, cream of chicken, celery, split pea, onion. Round it goes and the tub spins as you go around the circle. If you're not, if you weren't hungry before now, you probably are. Also, The Enchanter, a remake of The Ghost Train, um, to a Merlin the Wizard themed ride. And a ride for the kids called Animal Crackers. <coughs> Little animals that go around in a circle, really. That's what they did. Uh, but the kids enjoyed it. 1979, the Roundup came in. Defy gravity would spin around and stick to that wall. It would tip up on its edge. And in 1981, Kids Kingdom, which was really the latest um, in creativity. These were becoming all the rage in amusement parks. Um, all over the place, and they created their own version, an interactive playground. If you wanted to tire the kids out before you took them home, this is where you went. All kinds of stuff there, giant slide to slide down, and um, inflatables to climb and bounce on. There were ropes you could swing on, and big um, inflatable balls in a, in a giant pit back there. Boats you could pull yourself back and forth across the pond ball crawl, and there were many other things in there as well. Um, this was a really popular attraction, a very creative attraction uh, that many folks enjoyed. 
1984, uh, the log flume came in, the replacement for over the falls. That same year, they brought in a kiddie version of the flume called the Tippy Canoe, um, little canoes that went in a little, uh, little circular track. It operated for a couple of years. 1985, a new kids roller coaster called the Bunny Rabbit. Right next to the Jack Rabbit, you had the Jack Rabbit, the Bunny Rabbit right next to one another. And then something big happened. And I don't think anyone knew how big and how important it was at the time. These water slides. It looks like three water slides. It doesn't look like anything too spectacular. But this was the start of the water park. Water parks and amusement parks were frequently kept separate. And there was a trend that was starting where amusement parks were starting to install water slide complex. This is right within the parks. And Seabreeze was an early adopter of that. And these three slides, they changed everything. People would come to Seabreeze before this, after dinner, and you know, stay till midnight. When it was hot, nobody wanted to go to the amusement park. Now, when it was hot, that's the place you wanted to be. And people wanted to come earlier during the day. So the habits of the visitors to the park really changed. Um, so much so that you'll notice as the years go on, more and more water attractions are installed. Halfway through the next season, they installed a kids area called the um, Cascade Activity Pool, today called the Looney Lagoon with a water mushroom and some kids size slides. In 1989, they installed a swing ride called the Yo-Yo. In 1990, a new expansion to the water park. This tan colored slide that you see here, that was the latest in, in uh, water slides at the time. You rode on an inner tube and splashed down in the pool below. And you'll also notice all this area in the back here on the right, um, that was all new that year as well. That's the Lazy River. And it also had a lot of seating areas, a giant water fountain the kids could splash in. And now the water park's becoming something really special. And you'll start to notice that as the years go on, they start to alternate between attractions in the water park and in the amusement park. 1991, the kids' kingdom was replaced with a sea dragon swinging ship ride, some kids' airplanes, and a bounce house um, for the kids. Here's a view of that sea dragon today and the um, airplane ride as well. In 1992, a giant new water slide was built, this big two, uh, blue slide you see here through the tunnel. That was the latest that year. Now it doesn't dump you out in the mud. It's still <laughs> under construction there. It actually does go into the pool. There we go. Um, that came in 1992. And in 1994, this pair of water slides came in. But they were not the big news of 1994. The big news of 1994 was the fire that destroyed the beautiful carousel and the museum and much more. Um, it's a big job getting the park ready for the season. Huge effort. And at the end of March, they were preparing for the new season, repairing some holes in the roof, some leaks. And unfortunately, the, the roof caught fire. And it was a complete loss. The merry-go-round, the goofy house, the arcade, the rifle range. You'll notice on the other side here, the gyrosphere dome is ripped right open. And to make things worse, a lot of the ride vehicles for the winter are stored in those buildings. And so it posed a real, real challenge for them, but it didn't seem to hold them back very much because the park only opened two weeks late that year. And it, you would hardly know that anything had happened. Well, I guess you would know. Um, this is where the carousel was, a temporary midway was built. It had a tent with an arcade, pizza stand, some games and a seating area, a new kids ride that only stayed for a year or two, um, an airplane ride. And then the big new attraction that they brought in in 1994 was the Quantum Loop, a big roller coaster from France. Nothing says we're here to stay like a big new roller coaster. And they needed to make a statement after that fire to say, look, we had a setback, but we're not done. And I think this sent that message. The arcade was rebuilt in 1995. And then in 1996, the new carousel opened. 
And they had some big decisions to make when they built the carousel. Do they not build the carousel at all? Put something else there. I don't think that crossed their minds for very many minutes. Do we go and buy a modern carousel where the horses are made of fiberglass? And their heritage was as carousel builders. They weren't going to do that. Do we find an antique carousel and refurbish it? They didn't really find one they liked. So what did they do? They did what their ancestors did. They went out and built their own carousel. They had the horses carved by a fellow named Ed Roth in California. They did all the design. They had the rounding boards painted. They did all the paint work in house. And it's really a beautiful machine. They even had a replica of the band organ built um, to replace the one that was lost in the fire. And today the park has one of the most complete collections of Wurlitzer rolls um, in the world. And with the carousel done, that took a couple of years, they're ready to move on to other things. These are the modern attractions. Bear Tracks, New Kids Coaster in 1997. Screaming Eagle, Looping Ride in 1998. <laughs> Gotta have a strong stomach in that one. Soak Zone, a big water splash area in 1999. Water cannons, water guns, um, water slides, giant bucket. And the wave pool in 2001. And the wave pool really made the water park whole. Because now people go to the, sometimes people go to Seabreeze and only go to the water park. Um, they spend hours at this pool. And the water park has become a standalone attraction, um, pretty much. Some people will come only for the rides, some will come only for the water park, some will spend the whole day and do both. 2003, the spring, a little drop tower ride. 2004, the whirlwind roller coaster, a spinning roller coaster, right where that early hotel was. 2006, toilet bowl style slide, but much cleaner. 2008, the Music Express. 2010, the Revolution 360. That's where that first circle swing was. This disc swings back and forth, spins around as it goes. Uh, really a fun ride. Teacups in 2011. The Hydro Racer in 2012, replacing those original water slides, they were getting old, replaced them with this beautiful racing slide. But it was a much bigger project. They actually remodeled the whole water park. New walkways, new attractions, redid the bathrooms and the changing rooms, and really made that water park a modern facility. Swing ride in 2000. 14, similar to the yo-yo, but this one oscillates as you go around. And in 2014, the balloon race. Um, big and small can hop aboard that ride, get a nice view from up above. And if you have a strong stomach, the cars can spin around as well. 2016, this beautiful new patio where you can enjoy a lunch and a remodeled refreshment stand. This refreshment stand was the trolley station many, many years ago. It's still there today. 2017, the time machine, all aboard. And in 2019, um, a big upgrade to the soak zone where they installed this big purple water slide and a new kid's slide in the back and refurbished everything, making it beautiful. And now we're pretty much to the present day. The next thing, of course, was the pandemic. Um, all of the amusement parks in New York State were closed in 2020. Um, so Seabreeze did not operate that year. But back in business by 2021, when they celebrated the 101st birthday for the Jackrabbit, because they weren't open for the 100th, the 25th anniversary of the carousel, and put up all kinds of photo spots around the park. Now don't tell my sister that's her in that picture. She doesn't know she's in the show. <laughs> and that brings us to Seabreeze today. And I'm going to leave you with just a few images um, as we close up this evening. Today, Seabreeze is a beautiful family amusement park. There's something for everybody. And it's really a special place that we're so lucky to have right here in our own community. A lot of what we know about the history of the park is because of folks like you who have come to us and said, hey, I have old home movies. I have old pictures. Would you like to see them? And we look at them and we see something in the background that gives us new information. So I'd like to ask, if you have anything related to the park, 
Even if it seems insignificant, someone dancing in the dance hall or someone sitting on the jackrabbit, if you would consider reaching out to the park, they have a form on their website. You can email them or call them. They'll put you in touch with me, and we would love to see what you have. Um, that's how we learn the most about the past. <laughs> I hope that you'll come out to Seabreeze this summer and spend the day. If you're a senior citizen, um, I believe Tuesdays, I might be wrong on Tuesday, but I believe it's Tuesdays where they have free admission for senior citizens in July and August. Double check the website um, where you can come in and walk around or ride the merry-go-round and enjoy the park. Really a beautiful place. And I'll leave you with this view of the jackrabbit and these guys right down here who built it back in 1920. And I thank you for coming tonight. If you have, if you have time for questions, I'm happy to to build another one, the gyro ride with the double scrambler? I deal with the past. I can't tell you much about the future. Um, you know, anything's possible, but if I guessed, it would be a pure guess. I would love to be able to, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could see the future. That's a great question. A lot of people do ask that. Any questions that folks want to ask? Yes. What's your favorite ride at the park? My I have two. I love the jackrabbit, of course. And I love the flying scooters. I just, it's my favorite one. I love the challenge of trying to get it to fly right. And I, you know, instead of just sitting there doing nothing, you got some some skill to try to master. It's really a lot of fun. What's yours? Uh, yeah, good choice, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. How did they get the water for the natatorium? Oh, that's a great question. The water for the natatorium. They would pump it up from Irondequoit Bay into these giant glass lined tanks that they had. And that's where they would heat, heat it to 72 degrees, and they would um, salt it. And they would salt it? They would yeah. salt it, yep. They hauled in tons and tons of salt from the um, salt mines down in Livingston County. And that's how they would salt the water to match the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. Yes? Um, so you said that they built, I think it was the second dance hall on flat ground yeah. to prevent fires or make it more fireproof. Do you know why that, why they thought that? Yeah, because the original one was built over the ravine. So when it caught fire, um, the air just flowed right underneath it and right up through the structure. And so when they built it on flat land, the hope was it wouldn't have the same airflow, and therefore it wouldn't burn as quickly if it ever did, which we learned didn't make much difference, unfortunately. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Is Seabreeze yeah. still one of the few amusement parks that's independently owned and not part of a big chain? Yeah, it is owned. It's owned by, by the Norris family. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that does make it very special. Absolutely. Good evening. The library will be closing in 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's our notice. <laughs> Please use this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.